we are going live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are live now uh good evening everybody welcome again to today's evening uh, webinar from brought to you from the orthopedic research and education foundation uh today we have the pleasure of having none other than professor taneja from indore i think dr taneja needs no introduction and uh, he is been Uh, the president of the indian orthopedic association amongst many other uh, responsibilities that he has had in the past uh, he's been uh, obviously been involved in dnb examinations and ms examinations for many year, many years so i think we can't think of a better person to uh, tell us about uh, scoliosis uh, which is uh, a problem uh, which uh, could come as an ex uh, exam case and it is one which tends to uh, put people off because they are not uh, used to seeing scoliosis on a regular basis but it's also a case where if you know what to uh, look for in your examination and uh, have your have a clear decision making framework you can score very well on as well so i think uh, without much further ado i would uh, welcome dr taneja to give us his talk today which i'm sure all of you will find useful over to you dr taneja good evening everybody and thank you john for your introduction and welcome to all my postgraduate students from all over the country this is the orthopedic research and education foundation series which has been going on for now many almost a few years every tuesday we have this lecture and this time the subject that i'm going to cover is an overview of scoliosis you see the scoliosis is a very complex subject and uh, i had the privilege of getting myself trained in scoliosis surgery by no other person than charles manning a legendary in the field of scoliosis and he he worked at royal national orthopedic hospital in stanmore uk and which is one of the top hospital in the world in the field of orthopedics you all know these two big names nicola andre and paul harrington and the importance is this thing that if you i'm sure nicola andre must have seen this type of tree and he got an idea of splinting it and gave us an orthopedic logo i'm not surprised if the paul harrington might have seen this uh, tree uh, logo and might have got the idea of inventing this famous harrington rod the <clears throat> when i came back to indore uh, i was because trained by dr min mehta another famous orthopedic surgeon lady and uh, she was responsible for getting my training in uh, scoliosis i started a min mehta scoliosis scoliosis clinic at my hospital at uh, mgm medical college indore the <clears throat> our agenda for this talk will be you can see from this slide that we will try to cover almost everything but in a very brief and try to making it as simplified as possible for you to understand this complex deformity scoliosis is a very very complex deformity you can see uh, many of the even the senior consultants don't try to take up these cases because you need to have a very good understanding of this deformity before you can take up and to start treating this thing i'll try to make it as simple as possible for my postgraduate students now what is the first thing is a what is a scoliosis any curve is it a scoliosis any curve which is 5 degrees 10 degrees 15 degrees how do you this thing so the scoliosis research society took out an uh, definition that it is an apparent lateral curvature of the spine a curvature of the spine measuring 10 degrees or greater on this thing so if you draw the angle if it is more than 10 degrees then it is definitely you can call it as an scoliosis if you go to the historical aspect of this thing the way back uh, <clears throat> in uh, before christ the ancient greek were first to mention this spinal deformity no other person than the hippocrate he wrote extensively on this deformity but the word scoliosis which is a greek word 
and which means the crookedness was given by Galen in 200 AD. The very fact that you must try to understand that scoliosis is a three-dimensional deformity. It has a both in sagittal and coronal plane and rotation. And scoliosis, this deformity is just not the everything. It is just one of the symptoms, but scoliosis affects the many system in the body. Therefore, it has been now recognized that scoliosis deformity is just like one symptom. <clears throat> We, we all know about this famous story in the Mahabharata where a Kupja who had a kaifo scoliosis uh, was uh, by the touching the feet of Lord Krishna became absolutely straight. This is a very beautiful uh, description of the history of pedopathic scoliosis and its treatment starting from 400 BC, as I've told you, the different types of braces were this thing, who were the first surgeon and what all they did it and when did the particular screws came about which we will talk to you. And this is how the, there was a the development of scoliosis from way back from 400 BC. What is the incidence of a scoliosis? The incidence of scoliosis when the curve is more than 10 degrees, there are many school survey has been done to find it out. And on an average, it has been found that it is two to four percent, uh, two to four per thousand uh, population in this thing. So when I came back, uh, back to India, I thought it would yeah. be good to know what is the incidence of scoliosis in my country. And therefore, I did some school survey. The first school survey of the country was done in 1976 by my, one of my students, Dr. Y. Kothari. And then in, in another was done by Dr. Gotra, my another student. And then Dr. Rao, P.T. Rao of Katak did a survey. And then again at Riva, we had another survey done. And in Assam, Sekia did it. And in Patiala, Dr. Mittal did it. So you can see that there are six school surveys of scoliosis which has been done. We have published our results and our finding is that in India also, the incidence of scoliosis is two to three per thousand. We also published our uh, some of the articles and chapter in this very world famous uh, uh, monogram on scoliosis, which is taken out by the Scoliosis Research Society. In uh, my article appeared in 1976 volume uh, on the scoliosis in Marfan syndrome. The <clears throat> You see the scoliosis can have a single curve or it can have a double curve, but majority of the patient have got a single curve, which is seven is to one ratio. And the thoraco lumbar curve is the most common. Female to male ratio is three is to one in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. What is the etiology of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, which is still a lot of debated and a lot of work is going on. The fact of the matter is this, it is a multifactorial. The most important thing which has now come up is recently is in 2019, they have found out different genes of at least 26 types. And they say these genes give neurotransmission and hormones, which create a communication system and which allow the brain and body to talk and they maintain the balance. However, if there is a genetic variant or a scratching of the gene, there's a disruption of this brain and body uh, communication, and there is a spinal curvature starts developing, which gradually progresses what we call as a adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So this is being now accepted very much that it is basically a problem with the genetic. What is the classification which you all know? The classification, which has been very common for a very long time, is was given by the Scoliosis Research Society. And they say the scoliosis can be two types, non-structural and structural. Non-structural means that any deformity on forward bending will disappear. We all know that it could be a postural, it could be a, 
uh, compensatory because the limb length is can see it could be sciatic scoliosis some people are bent forward with a lateral bent hysterical patient and sometimes if you got a perinephric abscess it can be inflammatory and in order to avoid pain you can have a scoliosis most important about which we are going to focus is a structural scoliosis and that too mainly adolescent idiopathic scoliosis the most the idiopathic scoliosis again is infantile juvenile adolescent as per the age they can be congenital <clears throat> in which there can be a hemivertebra fused vertebra block vertebra maybe a fusion of the ribs anything and any neuromuscular which are the paralytic scoliosis due to neurofibromatosis or sometimes middle camel disorder like marfan syndrome etc now congenital now these three curves there is a basic difference the congenital curves are short and rigid okay you can see that this is a very short curve hemivertebra and paralytic curves are long c curves you say like this you can see that's a long c curve okay and they are very flexible whereas idiopathic scoliosis curves of a medium size and of moderate flexibility these three things must be kept in your mind the now the latest classification is a lenke classification in a lenke classification lenke has uh, um, talked about six types of curve and he, as you can see this thing the, um, it is very much in detail so what all you know that there is a lenke classification and the idea and the main contribution of the lenke is that this classification gives you an idea how to perform a selective fusion okay that's simple selective fusion means that patient has got a large curve has got a small mobile small mobile curve question is where i am going to fuse it so he said okay you have got a large curve select that fuse that leave the small curve as a mobile curve for the better performance yeah, by the patient so lenke classification is now mostly been followed by most of the scoliosis surgeon the what is a structural scoliosis what are the main features number one it cannot be corrected fully in forward flexion very important thing also called as adam test will show you and then there are structural changes in the body of the vertebra we will show you and there is a fixed rotational deformity of vertebra towards the convexity okay so let us see you see that patient who has got a scoliosis who has got an a because of the rotation the rib hump is there and if you see this diagram very carefully you will say because of the rotation of the vertebra in this direction the ribs go up and what is called as a rib hump now this uh, body of vertebra also get into the wedging and you can see that the spinous processes go into the concavity side and these are the changes that take place this thing so this is a very important thing that is the rotation of the vertebra now idiopathic scoliosis adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is in out of all the scoliotic patient it is about 80% okay now there are three important things to the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis it is a very slow onset it is a progressive problem and it is a painless problem now if you have a patient whom whom you find that has got a scoliosis but is complaining of pain also there then it is not an idiopathic scoliosis you must investigate patient thoroughly whether there is anything wrong somewhere and you will find there you will be able to find the cause <clears throat> now when you talk of the scoliotic curve there are always two curves one is the primary curve which is the biggest with a maximum rotation and least correctability where the secondary curve which are compensatory curve are small curves so and you can see that this is a diagram which indicates that if the patient has got a, a compensatory curve on lateral bending these curves will get corrected but the primary curve will not get corrected the this is the how you see on the lateral bending that how the curve increases or the how the this curvature can be reduced the most important thing now i come for my postgraduate student 
I have been examiner for last, uh, I do not know, from 1986 or so. And I have seen, I'm sorry to say, I've seen students getting a case of scoliosis and started crying, sir, I have never seen a patient of scoliosis in my life. Now, what do I do about it? So sometimes you put to such an embarrassing situation, but now the, because of the PG courses, the students now know how to approach and do a clinical examination. You all know that uh, how to do a spine examination, but there are a few things in the examination of scoliosis that you must know. So first thing is you must take a detailed history. And what are the special points you must try to find it out? When the curve was first noticed and by whom? Why patient is seeking a medical opinion? Is it just for deformity? Does the patient have respiratory distress? Does the patient has come for a medical general medical checkup? Or their patient has taken a treatment but is not satisfied? Deformity is progressive or static? And does that patient experience any neurological symptom? These are the few important things that you must record in the history. See the general development of the girl and the boy, whether the menarche has started or not, whether the voice changes have there. Because when you are reaching to that thing, the prepubertal state, then there are very little uh, growth left and the progression will be a little slow. So these things have to be taken into account. The general health, whether it has any problem with the breathing or has any past illness or any other deformities or anomalies in the body, then you start undressing the patient. You start with the gait, you all know that. General growth and development of the patient and very important is a chest expansion because they have got a thoracic insufficiency syndrome because of the deformity of scoliosis. Now there you all know that there are three types of body, uh, asthenic, which are lean and thin, and athletic body, muscular body, and they have a fatty body, what is called a pycnotic or endomorphic body. Now the few things that you must do in the scoliosis examination, one is that you take a standing height, two, you take a sitting height, three, you take a span. A span means a length from the tip of the middle finger to the tip of the other finger. Now, what is the importance of span to the scoliosis is that the span is equal to your height. But in scoliosis, the span is more than the height because of the deformity, the trunk becomes small. That is a significant thing. And anthropometrically, it is of great importance. Now, the, look at the level of the shoulder, whether one shoulder is higher than the other, that's important. Similarly, look at the scapula, which gets rotated forward and outward. The lower pole is deviated from midline on concave side, that you must record that, and then is the flat. When you stand straight, then both the limbs are touching each other, and this space is called at the flat. So in scoliotic patient, this flank is increased. And the other thing is this, when you are, if the curve is a lumbar area, and when you try to flex yourself, you'll find that the on convex side, the muscles become very prominent because there are no ribs. In thorax, it is a rib hump. And here, the lumbar spine muscles become taut and bulged out. And this is called as the Chaplin sign given from by the Russians. <clears throat> In a low lumbar curve with a poor compensation, even there's a tilt of the pelvis and pelvis tilts onto the concave side and hip on the opposite side goes higher. So shoulder level, scapula, hip level, okay. So this is how what you have to see starting from head down up to this thing, all things must be recorded properly. Now, after you have done this thing, then you mark the spinous processes in a like it has been done in this patient. And by this, you will know which area is the maximum curve, whether it is a right-sided or it is a left-sided. That is what is very important, whether there's a kyphotic component or not. <clears throat> Do a Adams test and Adam test will immediately uh, tell you whether the uh, deformity is persisting or not, and you will be able to differentiate between the structural scoliosis and non-structural scoliosis. Now, two important things. You have a rib hump. How do you quantify a rib hump? The quantification of the rib hump can be by a scoliometer 
or by a very simple water level, this thing. Now, here is the maximum rib hump. You put it here and put it in level. And then you go to this thing, say, for example, from this place to this place is five centimeter. So from here, you go to five centimeter and measure this distance. So more the distance, more is the rib hump. So this is done by scoliometer or uh, any water level instrument. The other thing that you have to test in this patient is the flexibility of the curve, which can be mild, moderate, and rigid. And you can do make the patient sit and start lifting it, or you try to press from the convex side and see how much you are able to get the spine straighter, which will give you an idea of the flexibility. The other very important thing is that the main thing in the, in the treatment is that you have to get the whole trunk into balance, both in sagittal and plane. Now this girl, you see that we use a plumb line, like right? Mason use it. Put it at the C7 prominent vertebra and let it fall down. Normally it should fall absolutely in the center. Now, if it falls onto the concave side, then there is a hardly any compensation. And it falls on the convex side, then it is an overcompensation. So this is the indication of a curves, whether they have been compensated or not compensation, raised shoulder on convex side, plumb line on concave side, it's indication of a poor compensation. Leg measurement is important, apparent shortening being, there's a indication of a poor compensation of a lumbar cup. Full neurological examination is a very, very important, which must be recorded. And at the time of presentation of your case, you say, sir, I have done the neurological examination. Patient doesn't have any neurological examination. After you have done it, you have to do a radiological assessment. Now in a radiological assessment, there are few things. One is that you take a AP laterally standing X-ray. You do a meta angle, which tell you how it is measured. Then to see the rotation, Nash and Mo, and of course to see the uh, skeletal maturity, you have the research sign. Now the uh, in the Cobb's uh, angle, you can see that uh, AP and lateral, and you should also be taking a, a lateral bending film in order to see how much correctability it is. The Cobb angle is the most commonly used. And few things that uh, students do not know, I'm trying to make it very clear. For example, you have got a, this curve, okay? Thoracic curve. Then in the central and the most convex area is called uh, the apical vertebra. <clears throat> At the end of the curve, from where there is a change in the intervertebral space, that becomes the end vertebra. Proximal and distal end vertebra. And just above the, this thing, this vertebra is called the neutral vertebra, where the other curve will start. So you must know what is a end vertebra, what is a apical vertebra, and what is a neutral vertebra. Now, this is a Cobb angle, and uh, this is the um, young old man Cobb uh, who gave about this angle in 1948. The procedure is that you find it out the uh, upper end vertebra, lower end vertebra, and from this you draw a line and draw a right angle line, and this is the angle which is being formed is the Cobb angle, okay. So this is a min meta, uh, this is my photograph in Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, where I was being trained by min meta, and the min meta gave a fantastic research for which he got a Robert Jones gold medal. He said that infantile scoliosis, if you have a rib vertebral axis deviation, then you draw a line at the long axis of rib and draw a line, perpendicular line from the vertebra and this angle, both on convex side and concave side. So you have the angle on both sides. So now if the difference of the angle between the concave and the convex side is more than 20, then it is called as a progressive curve and not a resolving curve. For this very work, which was published in 1972 in Journal and Bone and Joint Surgery, she got a very prestigious award. The displacement of pedicles are very important. That will give you an idea of the rotation. So that this is what you have seen that, the, the, the rotation of the vertebra, there is the pedicles are also moving. Now, Nash and Moe, Classification is very important. 
John Moe, when 1976, I was participating in the uh, uh, international meeting of scoliosis. I was one of the co-speaker with John Moe and I was very nervous. I was just new into the, this thing and he was about 75 years. So John Moe said that you see normally the pedicles are both here, here and here normal position. But as the rotation, <clears throat> radiologically, this pedicle starts moving. You see that from grade one to grade two, now almost come to the midline and then it has crossed the way. So the, this AP axis of the spine will tell you the severity of the rotation, which are very important for you to understand <coughs> what problem I'm going to get while doing the correction. The other thing is that uh, how do you assess the uh, physiological maturity by menarchal station, by skeletal maturity, and by seeing a research sign. What is a research sign? Research sign is nothing. You take an AP X-ray and you find there is an apophysis. And this apophysis, if it has just appeared little, it is one, half appeared two, three, four appeared three, and fully appeared four. And when it has got fused, it is called as five. Once it is fused, that means the skeletal maturity has taken place. And now the chances of progression are very little. However, the progression will take place, but will take place at a very slow speed. The additional view, sometimes you have to take a spinal curve to know the flexibility. For that, you can take a little bending films. You can see that there, how these films are taken. These are the little bending films that you can see that. And this we have already shown you. The, the, if you are dealing with a congenital scoliosis, it is a very, very important to have the get an MRI done. In our time, there was uh, uh, no MRI. When I was being trained, we used to get an MRI done. And uh, why? Because most of these patients with congenital scoliosis have got some congenital anomalies in the spinal cord. It may be tether cord syndrome, it may be syringe, it may be stomatomyelia, it may be bifid spine, uh, spinal cord. We all have seen that. You see that this is a tethering effect of the, one of our patients, and if which we also operated and removed this thing with the help of a neurosurgeon. This is another patient. You can see where the scoliosis has been done. And this is how they, they have done the reporting of this thing. So the MRI is extremely important. Don't touch a patient of scoliosis, unless congenital scoliosis, unless you have done the MRI. Other important investigation are that you do the vital capacity where the lung volume is reduced and do the ECG, which is normally. <clears throat> so what is the goal of treatment? This photograph that you are seeing is, it's very interesting. This is about the when I took it from TV in a World Cup, German versus Belgium, which just happened in last Sunday. And that is the photograph in this thing. So idea is to stop the progression of the curve, reduce the deformity, and maintain the trunk balance. That's the our this thing. We all know that the infantile scoliosis are resolving and malignant. And we also know that these patients who have got a more than 20 degrees of beta angle, they will increase. So what is the treatment of this condition? Now, you see, if you go into the literature, very interesting, the scoliosis patients have been anything possible, they have done it, hammered them, pulled them, pushed them, whatever, twisted them, but they never succeeded. So in infantile idiopathic scoliosis, most important that you change, observe, change every month plaster, do the bracing, keep this thing, but if you find the curve is uh, increasing, then of course you have to do a fusion. And of course you don't do a fusion in children below the eight years of age. Now, this is a very, very famous man, Dr. Cottrell at Berkplash, France. And I had the opportunity to have got some training from him also. And he uses a very unique thing. This is called the Cottrell dynamic traction. We put the patient onto the bed and on one side, when he is trying to uh, push this thing, the head goes up and the leg will push the body this thing. So thereby the whole spine is getting stretched. And his idea was that by stretching this thing, you can increase the flexibility and the, your correction will be better. This is the Institute, but where I worked with Dr. Cottrell. And please remember that 
the Cortes were responsible for introducing the two rods and the particle screw fixation. 22% <clears throat> get in a spontaneous regression by eight degrees in one year. Very important thing. So curve less than 20 degrees need to be only observed. If the angle increased by five to seven degrees, then at once bracing should be planned. And if it has been documented that the cases of in, in style infantile EWP exercise can be managed, 40% of the patient can be managed conservatively. Now we come to the most important thing, the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. First thing is, is a curve progression. Now 3% of the curve less than 11 degrees will improve. Double curves are more chances for progression. Single thoracic will progress more than the single number curve. And there are two ways by which you can predict the progression. One is called uh, the progression factor, where you have the Cobb angle, then you have the minus three into research sign and age. For example, you say a patient has got a 33 degree Cobb angle. Minus three is 30. Say the research sign is two. So 30 into two is 60. For example, the age is of the patient is 12. So 12, 60 divided by 12 is five. So that is how you take out the progression factor. More the factor, more the chances of prognosis. Similarly, there's another factor called as the Harrington factor, which is simplified the Cobb angle and number of the vertebra in the primary curve. For example, you have a patient who has got 30 degrees curve and who has got about only, uh, say, eight or 10 degrees of uh, 10 vertebra into this thing. So 10 and 30, it will be three. That means factor more than three in child the curve is likely to progress. Factor more than five in a mature patient will also progress and factor more than seven after maturity also will keep progressing. So magnitude of the curve, 20 degrees curve, 20% will progress. And if the curve is 90 degrees, 90% will progress. Very simple thing to do it. This is which we have talked to you about the uh, skeletal maturity. The most important thing to remember in your life the curve keep progressing throughout the life. But after the maturity, the rate is very slow. <clears throat> I'll show you some of my cases from this thing. This is a one patient uh, who had come into us in 2006. And you can see that how the curve has increased and even the, the kyphosis. So she had a very bad kyphosis scoliosis in four years because she did not have any treat. The curve has progressed to daughter's deformity. The more important thing is that uh, if you see a curve at the very first beginning, just observe and patient curve less than 20 degree, you have to keep observation and adolescent curve again, less than 20, you need observation. Now, if uh, uh, research sign curve is uh, and, and less than 20 degree, you don't have to bother about it. And research sign is fight, but curve is more than 20 degree. You have to see it very carefully every month. And but if the research sign is five, means skeletal maturity, curve is 30 to 40 degrees, you have to see every three years or every five years. So the curve less than 20, just observe. 20 to the 40, do the bracing. More than 40, go and do the surgery. The first surgery was done by a French surgeon in 1865 called Dr. Rain Gurian. And, but more famous it became in 1940 when Dr. Russell A. Hill did the first fusion of the spine in New York. So the surgery in scoliosis is basically a fusion. And in majority of the cases, it is a posterior. Then there is instrumentation stabilization the most common thing in which I was trained was Harrington instrumentation. Then also came the Luke uh, wires. Then came the pedicle screw by Dr. Cottrell in 1980. And now latest is a growing system in children and fusionless surgery like we do uh, by the uh, uh, figure of eight plate growth modulation. And of course, the latest is now the gene therapy in 2019, halopelvic traction and halogravity traction. This is a halopelvic. These are halopelvics are used for a high curve, cervical thoracic curve, rigid curve, which cannot be corrected. And I remember that at London when we were being trained, I used to, we used to pass at least one or two cases every day for the halopelvic traction. 
So the uh, uh, the surgical correction should be done within three years of the growth spurt. If the curve is increasing, do the surgery in a growing child and severe curve also you do a surgery in adolescent. But there is no cure of adolescent idiopathic sclerosis. These surgical techniques do not cure the sclerosis. Despite the surgical fusion, the curve slowly goes on increasing. And if it is not treated, adolescent etiopathic they will get back pain, respiratory insufficiency, they may die early, is a disfigurement which leads to inferiority complex. Like this lady who came to me, very shy, and she would, you can see that how inferiority complex is this thing. So what are the newer options now? I told to you that genetic variant is now the most important thing. It can be tested, it can be found it out, you can find it out which genes are responsible, which genes are scratched, determine the appropriate natural supplementation, and start a non-invasive early stage scoliosis intervention. This is the now in thing. Find out which children has a genetically high risk to these genes, and adolescent idiopathic sclerosis start therapy to correct the genetic deficiency, genetic engineering, what we call it, to prevent the adolescent idiopathic sclerosis. So it's a preventive treatment by doing the genetic engineering. <clears throat> what are the growing rods? Growing rods in the children, especially when you have done a fusion, the children still keep growing. So as a result of this rod that you have put in, is a, it becomes small, so you have to reopen it up and you try to lengthen this rod. These are called as the uh, growing rod, which are now all scoliosis surgeon top people are doing it, and other is a growth modulation. So what they do on the side of the growth where they, they're taking place, they put a, a two pedicle screw and try to this thing adjust the growth on one side and allow the spine to grow. This is a growth modulation. Is another new thing which has come in the market. So uh, we all know that. The bracing is very important and we know at up to what degree, say up between 20 to 40 degree, you can do a bracing. There are two types of bracing which are very popular. One is a Boston brace, which is used for the lower lumbar curve. And there is a mid Milwaukee brace. These are all my patient. And, and I taught my orthotics to make a Milwaukee brace for the thoracic curves, a little upper thoracic curve. So you have to use this thing. You have to wear it almost a uh, whole day if you want to this thing. Now I'll show you some clinical cases from my record and uh, then I'll show you this thing. Now this is the patient uh, Ranu Patel and uh, we have uh, our Arihant scoliosis clinic. From there, we have got the numbering that in which we this is a preoperative with your daily UK wiring. And uh, you can see that that's my prescription, what I advised in year 2008. Now, this is a patient uh, who, who is a uh, congenital scoliosis. You can, this is a short curve, hemivertebra. This is an MRI. This is the MRI report. This is an open it up and treated by the two rods on either side by the pedicle screw. You can see this thing. And this is after the post-operative period. Now, this case was my case in Arihant Hospital, but since I was not doing a particular screw, Dr. Lahiri from Bombay was visiting us and he decided to perform and demonstrate this case to us. The patient is doing well. This is Sunita H. In when the time when I used to do a Harrington instrumentation, this is the after surgery, now how straight she is. You can see this thing. And what is the interesting part is that uh, this is a, 20 years follow. When I operated, she was 10 years, and I was uh, surprised to see that my hooks have not come out, rod has not broken, there's no pseudoarthrosis, there's a good fusion of this thing. This is from my own record of this patient. You can see this thing. <clears throat> now I'll show you Dr. Padgonkar is my, uh, he was at one time my assistant professor. Now he's an independent spine surgeon in Indore, doing extremely a good work in scoliosis and endoscopic surgery. I, because I said, tell me what cases you have this day. So this is the first patient who is in a 14 years male who had a, uh, no th uh, right thoracic hump and also the, he had about D3 to D12 posteriorly instrumentation and correction and fusion early surgery. You can see there how the patient was. This is Dr. Patgankar case, how his now trunk is balanced. You can see that 
how the spine is absolutely straight. Similarly, there is another case you can see that also done by my uh, friend, and you can see how from this position you have got a pretty straight uh, uh, trunk balance. This is another third case you can see that again the particular screws, the double rod, and you can see the how the severe and grotesque deformity this patient had got it, and you can see this curve, which is a thoracic curve, how how much straightened it has been done. The another case of this similarly, you can see that again the particular screw fixation, the rotation done, and the spine is absolutely straight, and you can see the child that how straight and trunk balance has been achieved. This is another case, excellent uh, surgery and excellent performance and result by my friend. Now, in summary, what we could say that a congenital scoliosis, you do an early fusion. Younger the age to be more aggressive, observe curve less than 20 degrees, arthrosis when it is 20 to 40, operate when it is more than 40. So in conclusion, we can say and summarize what we have talked about that any curve which is more than 10 degrees is scoliosis. It is a three dimensional deformity. It is a symptom only. Incidence is about two to three per thousand. It is a multifactorial multi etiology. Scoliosis Society and Lenke classification are available. Idiopathic scoliosis of three types. One is infantile, resolving and malignant. X-ray, AP later, bending field. MRI in congenital scoliosis. Very important treatment we have already told you. Braces, Boston and Milwaukee Braille. Surgery is basically a fusion and stabilization by the particular screw these days. Newer option has come, growing rod, growth modulation. There are many complications that take place. You must remember, it is a very tiring surgery. Now from last about eight or 10 years, I will stop doing the, uh, spinal surgery and scoliosis surgery. I cannot stand three to four hours surgery. So neurological deficit are there, thoracic insufficiency syndrome, degenerative changes, pain, restricted mobility, pseudoarthrosis, so many problems. In my, this journey of scoliosis from 1975, I had about uh, six to seven students who did a thesis on the subject of scoliosis under me. We have published a few of the articles onto this thing. And I must say that I'm greatly indebted to my teacher, Dr. Min Mehta, who was in London, Royal National, Charles Manning, legendary figure in scoliosis, and Dr. Cottrell. These three people taught me the basic principle of scoliosis. Thank you all doctors and all my postgraduates. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Taneja. Uh, we also have Dr. Gautam, our spine surgeon there. I think I see his, him yes. there. So maybe Gautam, do you have any yeah. comments to add here? So everything uh, sir has covered uh, beautifully. And uh, just one thing I would like to say, the neutral vertebra is by definition the one which is neutrally rotated. So that yeah. needs to be uh, uh, seen. So the pedicles and the spinous process has to be seen on AP view. So that's the only thing I would like to add. Rest everything sir has uh, covered beautifully. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. So, Questions? Uh, yeah. So, uh, meanwhile, when uh, we are waiting for questions, sir, sir, two or three terms which is usually asked or uh, to be understood by the postgraduate one is that when we say uh, in all observation, we should keep the patient in observation. And when we say conservative treatment, so is it the same thing, sir, or do Observation means just observation. Okay, very simple question. You see, the unless until you put your knife or intervention, that becomes a surgical treatment. Till that you are observing, it is a part of the treatment, or you are giving a bracing, it is a part of the treatment, or you are giving a plaster of Paris casting, which is you normally do and treat infantile uh, idiopathic scoliosis, are all come under a conservative treatment. Okay, so there is not uh, much difference, but once you put in and do an intervention by surgical, it becomes a surgic surgery in uh, this thing. <clears throat> yeah. 
I think what you have to also look at is the curve progression. So yeah. a certain curve, which may be 20 degrees for which you would not normally offer any surgical treatment. If the next time they come within four months, a shot up to 40 degrees, you have to start thinking that you need to intervene. So I think yeah. those that are is the a, things. Uh, so your that, observation means you are watching the progression of the curve. Yeah, exactly. Conservative treatment would be when you're bracing it or using a Milwaukee uh, brace. Or exactly. The, uh, because you see the person who has come to you within a, say about 15 degrees curves or so, you have to observe it very carefully. And the moment you find that it is now crossing 20 degrees, you start treating them this thing. And then you do a bracing or whatever it may be. Once it crosses 40 degrees, and there is a growth spurt is there, you have to very seriously think of doing a fusion. So uh, one question in the chat box, sir, that indications of MRI in idiopathic scoliosis. And the second one is newer classification by SRS. Yeah, the, uh, the first question is, what did you say first question? That the indication of MRI. Uh, indication. You see, the MRI in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is not very essential, okay? Because it is in a idiopathic adolescent scoliosis and we don't expect any congenital and other anomalies or for any other reason. However, MRI is a must and mandatory in all the patient of in a congenital scoliosis. The, uh, this, what was the second question? So that newer classification by SRS. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I, uh, all I know that that the, the SRS had given that uh, on the basis of etiology that uh, uh, classification and uh, then came the Lenke classification. I do not know if any other classification has been given by School Research Society. If, if Gautam knows key, if there is any, Gautam may enlighten it, but so, not so recently, mind. sir. Apart from Lenke, yeah, yes, yes, Gautam. Hello, we've lost his sound. Okay, Gautam, sir. Okay, sir. So, uh, so there, is, there is a very complex three dimensional class. Yes, yes, sir. Is, sir, you are muted, sir. No. Just, yeah, just unmute him. Okay. Can you unmute him from there? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. So there is a three-dimensional classification which has just come up in recent paper, which is very complex thing, but uh, the students needs to at least be well versed with the King's and the Lenke's classification. Yeah. These days, most of the Spine and scoliosis surgeons are now using a King's and the Lenke's classification. And it is quite a, it's not as simple as I have shown you. It is a, if you go to the literature, a lot of things have been written and you have to understand what exactly this, they mean by a selective fusion area. And that is the Lenke's this thing. Yeah, perfect. Yes, sir. So uh, one more thing, sir. When it is in Elizarovin scoliosis, when we see mm -hmm. the image, it looks like like uh, that halo pelvic traction. What you have shown, because most of us have not seen that traction. Just briefly, if you can explain about that, about the halo pelvic. Yes, it's got nothing to do with Elizarov. Okay, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, I, I the... tell you. I know, I know, uh, one or two surgeons in the country also who are. Wow. trying to use some type of a system on basis on the elixir of, of a distraction for the scoliosis patient. Now the wow. hello pelvic traction, as the name goes, hello pelvis. So in the pelvis, from anterior superior iliac spine, you go to the posterior uh, iliac spine on from both the sides. So you pass the two rods and then you have the ring over the head on which it is a torque screw so that you don't pierce the inner table. So there are four or five screws which are put there. And then the, the hello, uh, which is on the head and the pelvic ring, which is by rod, uh, uh, is fixed to the two rods there. And in between then you have these rods 
as we have shown you. Now, these rods can be distracted. So, as you distract it gradually, as you do it in the case of Ely's law, you are putting a longitudinal traction. And this halopelvic traction is used mainly for a very rigid curves, high curve, say thoraco uh, cervical curve. I remember uh, one very interesting story which will interest you. It is not that easy. <clears throat> Myself and John was my co-registrar, and we were passing and doing a one hello pelvic. So as my friend passed the one pin from anterior spine to the uh, posterior, I found little uh, some tissue and membrane, which looks like to me that it was part of the peritoneum. I told John, I think we have pierced the uh, peritoneum. He said, no, no, it's all right. And then uh, we passed it to uh, the other thing. Next day, when I went to the round, and uh, his name was Mr. Tip. He was sitting there. I just examined and I found that his pulse was going down. There's something wrong. I made him lie and uh, he had developed a paralytic ileus and uh, he was an old man and a very famous man that I'm forgetting uh, who was who did a lot of work on the nerves. And he had sent that case from the uh, hospital to my boss. And then uh, by the time we resuscitated him, he died. And uh, I was, uh, I didn't know that coroner came and the lawyer came, they took the case history and everything. Thanks God, nothing came to me. Might have they filed a case to this. Thing. So you have to be very careful that the things which look simple are not that simple and pretty complicated. And you must be well versed on the technique before you touch these cases. So hello pelvic traction is also used in some trauma, okay? Yeah, okay. Early on, it used to be also used as stabilizing uh, for stabilizing trauma. Yeah, trauma. Uh, the, the, the spinal injury, they used to do it because they could stabilize the spine by this thing. That's right. But mostly it is now being... Uh, Nowadays it's uh, not used very a lot. Uh, not used because you see now the whole concept has changed because after the pedicle screws coming, epiphysialis is coming, the two rods coming, you can properly do rotate it. You can do the three dimensional correction. You can see on the table how much correction I've got it and however difficult this thing and surgical techniques have improved. So the use of the halopelvic traction is becoming less and less Always. to my best of knowledge. So uh, in your talk, sir, you have mentioned one Jacqueline sign. Yeah. So, is it specific for scoliosis or anything which is para uh, lumbar muscle? I think you have shown, sir. Para spinal in lumbar. Two is things. It? No, two, two things. The Jacqueline sign uh, has been, I didn't find it anywhere else except in Robert Rowe's book. Robert Rowe's book, is, there's a book on scoliosis. When I read that book, the Robert Rowe mentioned about this Jacqueline and he said this is from Russia. No, you see what he said, you any person who has got any pathology in the spine, and then what will happen? Your paraspinal muscle will be under spasm. But that doesn't make it to be a Jacqueline sign. Jacqueline sign means when there is a rotation of the body of the vertebra, and on the convex side, that part will go up. Like in the thorax, the ribs will go up. There's a rib hump. But in the lumbar spine, there are no ribs. So the paraspinal muscle, they become very prominent as compared to the concave side. And that is an indication of a rotation of a lumbar vertebra. And that is what is called as the Chaplin side. Okay, any more questions from the DNB students and postgraduate students? Otherwise, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Taneja. That was an excellent session. My pleasure. And, uh, hopefully, we'll have you again soon in the yeah. near future. Right, and, thank you. Uh, thank you. We have uh, so, about the postgraduate course. Sir. What yeah, do we know? yeah. Uh, John, either you can announce the okay, course. So, or... the Orthopedic Research Education Foundation runs uh, a postgraduate course, which is actually started and basically run by Dr. Taneja in Indore. And it started now more than 25 years ago. 27 years. This is 27th uh, yeah, year. So, more than, yeah, so, this is going to be the 27th year and is really a very popular course initially started for DNB students, but now it's attended by most second and third year PG students from all across the country and now even abroad. Even uh, abroad, yeah. yeah. We have a, it will be all on the Zoom also. So the people last 
course was attended from 11 countries and about 20 or 30 postgraduate students from and, abroad attended. And, and uh, a lot of people have uh, sort of commented on how they were able to pass the DNB exams because of the course. And I think it's definitely a course which uh, you should all attend if you're especially if you're appearing for the exams within the next year or so. So I think the details can be had from Dr. Taneja or Janki. And uh, uh, you should register because there's now less than a month left. Uh, and there are limited three, seats. Just three weeks and, and the yeah. number of seats are limited because there are a lot of clinical cases and discussions mm -hmm. and there's yeah. only a certain number that we can cater to. So uh, anything else, Dr. Taneja, you want to add? Uh, no, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, everything is on the, uh, we have sent it to this thing and uh, they, they can register. The information has gone to almost all postgraduates and to DNB students. And uh, the national board is always associated with us. And one of the representatives from the national board, vice president will be probably attending our course as a chief guest. So the students can interact for their queries with the person who will be presenting the national board examination. So that will be a good opportunity for them. Sir, so it is 23 to 26th of February. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, till next week, uh, bye. Thank, thank you. you very much, sir. Bye, thank sir. you very much. Good night. Bye, good night. Good night. Good night.